science fiction writers got us to the moon, gave us the elevator, gave us the escalator. If we can imagine it, I believe we can achieve it. But right now, we feel, and we really feel, hopeless. And a lot of people, though they might believe in climate change, don't think that individual action could make a difference. And I'm here to try to give you a little bit of hope. I'm not here trying to live in the world that the conservation groups are. I'm in that weird middle ground. What can an artist do to contribute to this? Maybe I can see it in a different way. Maybe if I can get you to see it in a different way, you could take a pause and rethink it. So we have a website. It's called whatismissing.org. On it is seated his story, stories of the natural world, things that have disappeared, things that are coming back. But also on the upper right is the what you can do's, as well as this thing called green print. What is it? It's um, reimagining what the future could look like, plausible future scenarios. If you play with it a little, it is a very wonky website. Forgive me. Um, you can view stories in time or in place. You can sort through from videos, personal stories, conservation successes and failures. Um, and please feel free to play. We build ecological timelines of cities, rivers, and species. Why? Because if you trace back the disappearance of salmon in England, they knew that what they were doing in overfishing was going to make it disappear. But the politicians could never vote for protection because economy and jobs were always full frontal. History repeats itself. And if we can begin to learn more from what we're doing, maybe, maybe we can change things around. So by Earth Day, it's a volunteer project for me, so I surface on Earth Day. This Earth Day will have over a hundred timelines that you can collect and share. Uh, we're sending one out this Thanksgiving because you might not know that the wild turkey in America almost went extinct. But then what do we try to prove? Legislation, first awareness, then legislation, and then the species comes back. So again, it's only through legislation and conservation, and oftentimes this starts as a grassroots movement we can turn things around. Nature is resilient. Don't forget it. If we give it a chance, it comes back. So things you might not know. Lobsters, six feet long. Sturgeon were so plentiful, boats in the Hudson River collided with them. They were nicknamed Albany beef. But we invite anyone to share a memory with us. It can be of loss. It can be of hope. It can be conservation become personally connected to what's missing in your own backyard. So that's, again, trying to make it human, trying to connect you on a very visceral human level. So we've got great stories coming in, and we invite everyone here to share a story with us. WGBH, we're so proud to be working with them to bring the map of memory to high school kids. What better group to learn about what's missing in their own backyard? And then we'll be asking them, to volunteer for a conservation group in their area. Get involved. Again, global and local, and you better believe we're going to be doing that more now than ever. So that's what we're doing with PBS. And what I'm doing is working on green print, which is really envisioning the future, how we live, where we live, what we spend our money on. So I'm just going to go through it a little bit. The what you can do's are all up. You can download them. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. You can go in. Each one of these is up there. You can share it, send it around. We're after the intersection. The driving causes of species loss and climate change are all those bubbles in the middle, and that is habitat loss and degradation. That is equivalent to almost 50% of all climate emissions. So here we go again. Habitat can both protect species and reduce climate change emissions. So we trace back, again, a little wonky, how we live, how we eat, what our carbon footprint is. Uh, again, you know, Mark was amazing this morning eating meat. Uh, huge impact. The amount of acreage needed to grow the grain, to feed the cow versus eating a vegetarian diet. And so then we start playing with things like this. I would have never known that eating a rabbit is so much better than eating a sheep. 
or that a sheep was as bad as an industrial cow. So we do things like this. They're a little cute, they're a little unexpected, and I hope um, you kind of laugh at it, but you also go, hey, I had no idea. You can draw it to its logical conclusions. You end up with bugs, sorry. Rats, not a good idea. And if you don't want to eat a bug, though, if you know it, the FDA allows at least two, uh, the average American eats two pounds of ground up bugs in their meal because we can't get it out of the grain when we're harvesting it. So that's in the FDA law. So we do have slides about that. Go, they're funny. Um, but this one I couldn't resist because as one scientist said, well, if we keep feeding the fish to the chicken, our chicken are gonna taste like fish and our fish are gonna taste like chicken. So what do you think fly fishing is all about? And what do you think a free range chicken really would be eating in your backyard? So again, maybe we could reconsider why we're feeding all that soy protein and fish to our farmed animals. So these are the things we go for in our infographics. When you eat a tuna, it's like eating, I think as one another expert said, it's not the tiger you're eating, it's the animal that ate the animal that ate the tiger. You're going that far up the food chain. It is about as silly as you could be as far as efficiency. Um, go for something that's vegetarian or look at those shellfish, an amazing seafood to eat. So we do things like this. I'm just gonna go through it. Feel free to go play with it. We always link you back to the habitat and we're about to start linking you to the species at risk in those areas. But I wanna get into green print. So we've got lots of infographics. Green print, a lot of this is gonna be about habitat restoration. So I'm after this, no-till conservation farming and the capacity that Rodale is now doing the research to be able to absorb carbon and bring life back to the soil is massive. And as Mark said, we have not seen it. It's been this invisible answer to a lot of issues and it would feed the nine billion people that we're heading towards. So green print, what ifs. It starts with what ifs. What if we brought, rethought how we spend our money subsidized good practices rather than bad, adapted the best sustainable practices, shrink our agriculture and grazing footprint, shrink our suburban and urban footprint, rethought energy. So this is what maybe I can do as an artist to get you to rethink what the problem is. So if the World Economic Forum says it would take 700 billion annually to mitigate climate change, which sounds like a lot of money, how could we possibly do that? I just show you what else we're spending our money on. Take your pick. And what I say is we're spending our kids' futures. And this I love. Um, a lot of the categories of how to protect biodiversity are from Lester, Brown, Lester Brown's book, though we did add a few in, like if you want to protect all biological diversity on the low end, it's 31 billion. My God, that's equivalent to business entertainment in Japan. Ironic that the pet industry worldwide is what it would take to protect all biological diversity. And I'm not saying don't have pets, I'm just saying we spend this money, it's chump change. What could we be doing? So, Again, framing it in a new light. That's maybe, I hope, what art can do. So this is really isn't about everyone moving to Colorado or living in an urban way. 50% of us live in these cities. By 2075, 75% of us will actually by 2050. How can we green those cities? And I think as the election shows, you can't just think about the cities even though the power and the energy usage is massive when it's there. So we're doing a lot of stats running. We're going through best practices. I just wanna end with one thing. Yes, a lot of focus has been on cities, but what this election did is I wanted to start drilling down on, well, this came out of a map from the New York Times about rethinking how we think of our city to rural areas in our hubs, how we could begin to be more inclusive so that what all the job gains that we've had in the cities could be shared with the rural areas. And this is almost the only way we can begin to think about not the blue state versus the red state, but think about our regional areas and how we can begin to work together as communities. 